Hey everyone, Chris here. Welcome. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, preparations in general. I've had a series of prepper challenges where we're testing food that's been uh, in the food storage for years, uh, uh, much past its best use by date. But the food part of the preparation is just a part of it, right? I want to talk a little bit about um, preparations in general and how, how you can start to prepare yourself um, if, uh, if you haven't already. And also maybe broaden your view of uh, some of the things that you might want uh, while you prepare. So when I think about putting together my preparations, I generally look at things um, in two categories, things that have some use or a trade value. And so like a canned good has both of those, right? Where I could eat it, but I could also trade it for something that I need that I don't have with somebody who wants my canned good. So that's something that has use value and a trade value. And then there's other things that just have only, uh, only s currency value, for instance. And so, you know, when you start to think about preparations and, and you start to think about worst case scenarios, are thinking about end of the world, how am I going to <laughs> conduct basic commerce uh, in this type of, uh, you know, market, uh, very primitive market society. And you start thinking, well, maybe I should hoard gold. I need gold coins or silver coins. And, and I've had those thoughts and I still have those thoughts about how much I should, should I have a store of gold or a store of silver? And it's, um, to be honest, it's very, it's hard to resist, right? But I will tell a little story. Now, when I was 16 years old, I worked at Kmart back on the East Coast. And for some reason, I purchased a silver coin that was, it was on, it wasn't on sale, but it was part of some historic period event. It was, it was a constitutional coin. And so I bought it in 1987, I believe. Um, and this is the only silver coin I have. I think I paid $26 for it, right? And it's, um, it's in its little plastic case still. So this is $1 of, uh, point let's see if it tells me what the quality of the silver is it doesn't even say what the, but probably it's either 999 or four nines as far as the purity goes and there probably is some documentation that I have with it but so this is a, a silver coin right so theoretically this could be a form of trade if I wanted to buy a pizza from a guy I would give him my silver coin and that's great I think um, my style of planning for preparation doesn't allow for me to it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, I'm not predicting what the, the currency will be in a future state because uh, it's just, that's too variable. It's too variable, right? And oftentimes there's going to be a local government that's going to, in some cases, tell you what the local currency is. Is it some note issued by a government? Um, who knows what it will be? But what we do know about gold, for instance, is that it was, it was ownership of it was outlawed by the United States for decades during the 1900s. It was illegal to own gold, right? So it's not uncommon for governments to, to exert their influence through laws on what you can use to trade. So that brings me back to just what is the a use value and a trade value for every item and what items might I want to stockpile with that in mind. So I have a few. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through each one briefly. We're even going to take a test. We're going to test one of them because I'm not 100% positive that one of these items that I've chosen to store is going to work, right? But we'll start with the basics. So in times of extreme, uh, you know, ex extreme crisis situations, uh, it's hard to beat matches, right? Just good old fashioned matches where you, it's a wood match. You strike it against the side here. Um, and you're going to have fire, right? And fire is a kind of one of those low-level hierarchical needs that you're going to have, you know, for warmth, safety, the ability to stay, uh, you know, in a heated environment, heat your food if you need to. So on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that pyramid, the very bottom level are some pretty basic things that you're going to need. And the ability to create fire is one of them. And the ability to trade a box of matches for something is another, so it, it moves you one step above that basic need. Your, your, your ability to make fire has been met, and now you have the ability to trade with others who need to make fire to get something that you may need. So boxes of matches are easy. You, you know, two, one or two or three bucks, you can get quite a lot of matches. There's 250 in each box. I've got 
several of these. So this is 750 matches. So fire is critical. Now, you want to do your own research as well. And what led me to some of these conclusions about the types of things that I was going to store was reading a, a guy named Selko, who is he's a Serbian who lives in, well, he lives in, I think, Sarajevo now. And he, was, he lived through Sarajevo during the Serbian War that happened in the early to mid-90s. And it was a horrible a horrible event for that nation. I remember watching some some news uh, video of it and it was, I still have bad memories of what I saw on the news. It was not good. I was surprised what I saw. There was blood on the streets. And um, so it was a it was a classic urban environment with rule without law. I think there was also countryside environments were impacted where it was, you know, for the better part of a year or so, it was gang, gangs ruled. Uh, the lives of anybody living in those areas. And so the stories that come out of that environment tell you how bad it can get. And it also tells you some of the things that you might want to have um, in preparation for that. And also some of the, some of the tactics that you want to employ to, to stay undercover, to not be noticed. Right? There's all kinds of things that you're going to want to take into consideration, which I'm not going to cover here, but I'm going to cover just the types of goods that you may want to think about so that rather than hoarding silver, which I'm not advocating you do or you don't, but I will say I ran the calculation on my $26 coin back in 1987. If I put that 26 bucks into an interest-bearing account making 7% per year, which, you know, that's, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect you could get that. If you're just invested in the market, for instance, um, I would have 200 and 220 or you know a little over $200 instead of what I have today is a coin that's worth about $26 if I was to sell this on eBay and this is the year 2020 so here I am 33 years later and the coin that I bought for $26 has not appreciated right so as investment strategies go this does not seem like a winner to me um, to me personally you know I've lived this one uh, it's not to say that you may not have different success but so as investment strategies go, I don't see silver being a winner. And as far as its ability to be used for trade, I'm not convinced that it's going to be practical, right? Because when if society gets to the point where you are trading cans of beans and, and your you know bags of rice and matches, the currency is going to be the least of your concerns. And the problem with a coin like that is it's hard to can it's hard to establish what it's worth. And once you're out, you're out, right? So let's say you got 100 of these things. You have 100 options to buy things, and then you're kind of out. Whereas this, this could just as easily be converted into a silver coin if it's that bad. I only need to find a guy who has a silver coin and doesn't have matches and wants matches, right? So when you think about the items that you're going to prepare in store, uh, think about their use value, right? And so fire is fundamental, your ability to create fire. Um, if you don't have access to the natural gas lines for whatever reason and you have no ability to create fire, uh, matches then become a pretty critical need for you. Now, related to matches is uh, what we call the more modern version of the match, and that is uh, the Bic lighter, right? And so the concern that I have about a Bic lighter is that the flint could wear out um, or could degrade, and then also it, it has lighter fluid in there that it could evaporate theoretically. And so what I have here is a a 50 pack of Bic lighters that I bought back in 2012. So maybe they were packaged up in 2011. I bought them online from eBay or something like that, some vendor. Um, it's, this is essentially what you would, this is a box that you would buy if you were running a, a convenience store and you'd put out front there and you'd sell these things for a buck or two, right? So I just bought a pack of them, actually several packs of them. Um, they're all sealed up. I put it, I immediately put it in a Ziploc bag. Um, I dated it so that I know what the date was, but I'm gonna open it for the first time we're going to see how if, if any of these things light, right? So this is the date I put these was 9-22 of 2012. I'm going to pull one of these out and see if it lights. All right. Oh, it's still, yeah, still has a good amount of fluid in there. I can't see through it, but I can, I can hear it shaking. So here it goes. These have been sitting in my crawl space for eight years. Yeah, very good. Lights right up. Okay, I'm, ha I'm, I'm glad to see that. I'm going to put that back. I'm going to wrap it, put it back as a wrapper. We want to keep moisture and any, any other environmental elements out of it. Put it back in its box or ba its bag here. And so for me, this, I look at something like this, 
this bag of lighters um, is really nothing more than currency, right? This is, I'm certainly, I don't need, this is 50 lighters. Um, I don't anticipate that I would need 50 lighters for myself and I have, you know, I'm not, I'm not bragging about stores, but I have more than that even, right? And the idea absolutely is, is that, <coughs> excuse me, you're not, uh, you're not preparing just for yourself. Right? You're pre preparing for the community around you, um, you know, and you certainly don't have to be a Scrooge McDuck with this stuff, right? If a neighbor needs lighters, you can give these things out. There's no need that you trade for them, but they have a use value, and the use value is universal. So whether you're, you know, in the hills of uh, Montana or the mountains of Montana, if they have them there, um, or you're here or you're anywhere, you're in a city, a, a big lighter is a very practical, uh, very practical tool, um, and there's some value inherent in that. Now, when we talked about, I mentioned Selco. So if you just you know, Google Selco, Serbia, I'm sure you'll stumble onto the guy's uh, websites. He has a blog. I think you can actually take courses from him. Uh, part of it is there's an arms, you know, a, a weapons and um, kind of a tactical element to some of the stuff that he talks about. I'm not as interested in that. Um, but one of the things that he mentioned that struck me was how gloves, something as simple as having gloves around in times of crisis uh, situations that he described involved doing a lot of foraging um, and there was a lot of damage due to war. So a lot of buildings had collapsed. Uh, people were going through the buildings looking for anything that was salvageable that they could eat, that they could use. And oftentimes people were cutting themselves and when, when the, you didn't have antiseptics and cleaning agents available, um, a simple cut on your hand could turn into a life-threatening situation where the cut became infected. There was no qualified uh, medical facilities around to help you. You had no, uh, no medical equipment or uh, uh, cleaning agents yourself. And so, yeah, people died from something as simple as a cut on their hand. So he said something that became very practically valuable for them was gloves, right? And so a pair of gloves like these maybe cost you eight or nine bucks at the hardware store. You walk by the bins of these all the time. And uh, the next time you're there, pick one up. Throw it in your throw it in your shopping cart, um, and then just store them up because. And, and I make in my house people make fun of me. I have a lot of dis, these types of disposable work gloves, and they're certainly not for me. These will have trade value, right? These will have use value for other people who don't have gloves handy. Um, and so you you know within your local you know let's say two mile radius, if if, if really bad stuff happens, this is the type of stuff that you may want uh, to have ready. The other things that we've looked at in previous, we've done taste tests on some of our canned foods. So look for canned food um, that, that holds up well, um, that ages well. As it turns out, most canned food is going to be okay. Um, this was stuff that's 2015, so it's five years old at this point. We taste tested it in an earlier video, and it was just fine. Um, things like instant coffee. So this is, this is uh, you know, powdered coffee, essentially. So you just add this to hot water, but, um, you know, Coffee in times of trouble is just a real, if nothing else, it's a morale booster. And so being able to provide hot coffee to people who need hot coffee without having to have fresh beans or, or you know, grind, uh, ground coffee, uh, that's, a, that's a valuable thing. Um, and you can, you know, I don't know what the expiration is on this. This says to sell by April of 2014, but I suspect if I was to put these these uh, dehydrated coffee grounds into a cup of hot water, they would taste just like kind of low grade coffee that they would the day you bought it. And I'm not a coffee uh, aficionado myself. So to me, coffee is coffee. I drink folders <laughs> normally, so my, my, my standards aren't terribly high. Although I do believe there is something about engineered food, coffee specifically, that makes it okay. Um, so that's that. That is, uh, you know, some basics uh, regarding things that you want to consider when you're prepping. It, there's a food element for sure. Food is, you got to have that to stay alive. So when we're looking at planning for uh, our preparations, uh, some of the things that we're planning or preparing for are, well, and they're, they're varied, right? And, and the impact on them is going to be different depending on what the situation is, but you've got natural disasters, in Alaska here, uh, you know, we have earthquakes are, are not an uncommon thing. We had one in the 60s that was devastating. We had one just a little over a year ago that was uh, significant, did significant damage to our highways. 
Many houses were damaged, uh, some irreparably. Um, and it definitely reminded you how fragile your existence is on, on the surface of the earth. Uh, in the lower 48, I know they have tornadoes, they have hurricanes, uh, we, even in volcanoes here in some cases, we have active volcanoes nearby and we haven't had any that have been ma massively disruptive, but we've had some that have erupted and you see ash pile up. So uh, in addition to that, uh, you have what are not necessarily natural events, but you've got you know, uh, international or domestic uh, problems that could arise, even turning into things that, such as you know, localized warfare. You can look at um, you know, parts of Europe, some places in Africa, um, Central America. Uh, the world's had flare-ups of you know, war that it clearly impact local, uh, local environments and the citizens living in those places. So, um, and oftentimes, rule of law is abandoned. Um, the power hierarchies that materialize can have whatever agenda that they're going to have, and you're going to have to live within that, right? Um, and then you have natural disasters that are, you know, thankfully we haven't had any that are on the scale of a global type of, you know, meteor event, the things you see in the movies. Um, but all of them have in co all of them have common themes in that they can disrupt supply chains, right? Which is probably the most critical thing that as soon as you sever a supply chain in Alaska, we're specifically susceptible to this, right? We have a lot of we're dependent on shipments of goods, right, that come in via uh, air, ship, and then we also have some that come through Canada on the ground. Um, and so if those supply chains become disrupted, Alaska will, will be significantly challenged um, to make do without supplies for, you know, whatever the period of time is. I think th there is a view that, and it's especially prevalent in Alaska, that you can go out and you can, you can subsist and live off the land, um, but I'm not sure that that holds true, especially in population, uh, highly, uh, highly populated areas where the population densities are significant, access to local wildlife is not significant, so I'm not sure that the uh, old tried and true Alaska mentality will hold up if you're actually, actually trying to live on food, but it's not all about food even, right? Some of the things that you need, uh, they're just supplies. So, uh, yeah, there's a variety of type of events that could occur that you're planning for, and the common theme amongst them all, you know, beyond just supply chain, is that you will not necessarily know what you're going to need. Um, so you plan on providing for the basics, things that you will meet your that lowest level of Maslow's hierarchy, which provides you safety and security. So that is heat, food, and shelter, kind of become your critical your critical items. Uh, some folks might throw weapons into that. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to talk about that, although I think that, uh, you know, I believe in uh, people's right to own weapons to protect themselves and, uh, you know, leave that up to you. I can do a whole separate video on that. I do own plenty of guns, just as a, just to be clear on where I stand. So when you're, when we start to talk about preparing or thinking about preparing, I think one of the first obstacles that I ran into myself is just the, it was pretty basic. It's storage. Where am I going to store supplies? Um, I live in a pretty small house. I think we're just under 1,700 square feet. There's not, we're not overflowing with storage capacity. And so the idea that I'm going to store supplies that would last me, you know, upwards to a year and that I could also store additional supplies that would allow me to have things that I could engage with trade, meaning I'm essentially stockpiling, warehousing certain types of goods. Um, that's a challenge, and that's something you want to think about before you, you before you hit the hardware stores or any of these stores beginning to accumulate stuff. Because what you're going to quickly find, and I found this, is that you'll you'll put them on somewhere in your house if there's spare room, and stuff just starts to pile up. Um, and and maybe if you have a spare room, you that's that is where you uh, store your stuff. Some things you're going to want to think about when you specifically looking at storage locations is temperature. Uh, light, so you want it to be a low temperature environment, a low light environment. Light and temperature, high temperature often degrades some of the, the containers that you're going to uh, be storing. Um, you want it to be ideally low traffic. You want it to be secure. I'm not a fan of broadcasting what I have, although it's, you know, I've taken a lot of, uh, a lot of 
uh, a lot of my friends have poked at me for even putting any of this online. However, you know, I'm not, uh, I feel it's important to be able to share, you know, some of my experience with others because I know I've learned from others online as well. So give some thought to how and where you're going to store this stuff because this is stuff that's going to be around for years. You may never use it. You may use it and when you need it, you're going to need it and you want it to be in a quality and a state that uh, is, it provides some value to you, right? It makes no sense at all to store this stuff if the moment you need it, it has spoiled or has become unusable for whatever reason. So, you know, if you're storing matches, make sure that they're not stored in a place where they're going to get soaking wet if a pipe bursts or something like that. So give some thought, right? And it, it pays to think about that on the front end. Now, additionally, as you're, uh, you're building up your stores, it's not something you're going to do overnight. And don't feel like you have to go out and buy $10,000 worth of equipment or supplies overnight. It's very much you can take an investment strategy approach to this and, uh, you know, buy continuously, right? So every paycheck say, well, I'm going to spend 20 bucks or I'm going to spend 50 bucks, whatever it is, just buy a little bit. Uh, you know, I think with my, with Dinty Moore, what I would find is I would often, you know, when I get paid, I would go and I'd buy a case of Dinty Moore, which was 12 cans. Each can was running me and I always looked for the deal. So I would always shop for uh, specials on Dinty Moore and you could get a can for three to four bucks, uh, fairly often you say three times 12. So I was buying between 35 and $50 worth of Dinty Moore every paycheck. And you just do that, right? And you can run the, you know, the, the, the calculation on how much you need is pretty basic. You can look at a, a can and look at the calories in the can, run the math on how many people in your family, how many calories a day are you going to need. If you're going to store something like rice and beans, you can start to think about when you're cooking this stuff, maybe I cook some rice with it and add it to the Dinty Moor so that I have something more than just Dinty Moor. And that kind of stretches out how much the Dinty Moor would feed people because you're adding rice to it. So you'll start to run some basic cal calorie calculations on what's it take. And then you can decide how long you need to have supplies for, right? Does it have to be for a week, two weeks, two days, a year? Um, that's, those are all things that, you know, really only you can decide for yourself because it may, it may be that you just don't have space to store things for a year and that's not practical in any way. And you would never hunker down for a year, right? So the space, I can't, I can't stress how important it is to have a space to store your stuff um, because otherwise it does get out of hand. It's going to be hard for you to ever get a sense of how much you actually have because you are going to want to have some sense of what inventory do I have? Like how many cans do I have and all of this stuff? So, you know, as you're planning, think about that in advance. Um, for me, I got incredibly lucky having have a crawl space that's accessible, has a fair amount of height. Um, and I did build some storage racks in the, the crawl space so that uh, I had ability to store on shelves all everything that I was looking to store. And that's really the basics for today, what I wanted to talk about. Uh, just to, to have a discussion beyond just a food taste test, which I do enjoy the food taste test, but to talk about other aspects of preparation. Uh, you know, you, you can start small, uh, do some research, do a lot of reading. Um, you know, there is not a one size fits all for preparing yourself, um, you know, you can definitely, you can take the baby steps to get there. Um, you know, there's a whole nother, a whole nother uh, set of discussions that I'll likely have a video on about related to some medication, some base, you know, things like ibuprofen, aspirin, um, medical supplies that you might want to maintain. Um, and, but those things have their, a shelf life. And so we can talk about how, how to use those and how to adjust for a shelf life. And I'm not a doctor, so uh, I'm not prescribing anything here, but uh, there is there is an element of preparation that is much more about uh, medical and your ability to deal with those types of issues uh, in the event of a, an emergency uh, where medical uh, aid is not available. So anyway, on that uh, happy note, I hope this was useful to you. If you have any questions, please put them down in the comment box. Uh, thanks for watching, uh, and as always, uh, take care, and we'll see you next time.